Welcome to Around the Lake for the week of April 15th through the 22nd. I'm Josh Brokaw, your host today. I'm here with Bill Chasen, Managing Editor of the Ithaca Times. Uh, we're going to talk first off about the fire at the Chapter House, which I'm sure a lot of people have already heard about by the time you're watching this on your mobile devices or on Pegasus Channel 13. So uh, you were on the scene first. Yeah, we, at the we live house. at the bottom of East Hill, and there was somebody walking by our window saying, the chapter house is burning down. So uh, I got up the hill by about, I think, about quarter of eight, and the flames were no longer coming out of the building at that point, but there was a lot of smoke coming out of that building. And the entire, uh, um, the entire fire department was there. Everybody who was on duty was there. Um, Bang's ambulance was there, but they had accounted for all the people in the building, and there was no there was no danger of anybody getting injured. Um, Tom, I think there was one one person who was unaccounted for for a while in early reports. Right. And yeah. Tom Basher to told me that he was out of the something. country. Yeah. yeah. And so that was the one worry, uh, and that was that was yeah, so. By the time you know eight o'clock rolled around, they were pretty sh they were sure that no one was in there and everybody had gotten out okay. But it's a landmark building. Um, I'm not sure how old it is. I was told it was built in 1950, but that can't be right. Um, it looks like it probably is about 100 years old, 1915 or so, just by the architectural style. Mm -hmm. it's, a mason, it's a masonry building on the outside, but the inside is entirely wood, which uh, Tom Basher, the spokesman for the fire department, said is called ordinary construction. And, uh, and so the whole thing was burning. Uh, and what time did you hear about the roof collapsing? Uh, about 11. Yeah. So that was when I was on the other yeah. secondary fire they had later in the morning. And so uh, uh, Basher was telling me that they pour a thousand gallons a minute out of the fire hoses. And by the time I got there, they had been doing it for four hours. And so that's a, it was about a million gallons of water, they estimated. And actually, the the, uh, the, the streets, the, both Seneca and Buffalo, were just running with water. Uh, the, 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 the gutters were just filled. It was going down the storm drains, overwhelmed the storm drain, came up the storm drain, f f further down the hill. The DPW was clearing that out. It was a big fire. And um, the chapter house is, is just kind of this storied live music venue and uh, Cornell drinking bar. Uh, before it was the chapter house, it was called what? I think it was just something like Joe's Place. Jim or Joe's? Jim's, Jim's, yes. But that's also according only to the sketch history that uh, Jake, one of the bartenders there, gives people. So, you know, it's one of those, it's more bar history than, yeah. you know, the article on the wall. <laughs> so that, that, that is, is going to be tough. We just lost a live music venue, which in Ithaca is, is a real tragedy. And um, so it remains to be seen what will happen. The Irish session uh, happens every Tuesday there, I believe. And so yesterday, <laughs> they didn't have one there. Uh, and they won't ever again, because the building has been declared a total loss. Um, yeah, I think there was a picture making the rounds of the back of it. If people have seen the, the front shots, you still see the sign, a lot of debris, but it's kind of hard to tell, because the facade is still there. But if you look at the back shot, I think the uh, picture I saw making the rounds last night was actually from someone, and I haven't figured out yet if, whether it was the fire department or an independent uh, photographer had a drone flying around, and it looked like an aerial shot of the well, back. Well, Jim Belinsky, our publisher, mentioned that one of the, the retired firemen has a drone, and I think it was him. Like, okay, that uh, makes sense. But um, they did a pretty amazing job of containing the fire. Um, anybody who goes online and sees the flames that were leaping out of that thing. Uh, should be impressed that uh, one building adjacent to uh, toward the creek from the chapter house building uh, was burned, and it looked like it was pretty much destroyed. But the buildings in back of, of the mm -hmm. chapter house, which were pretty close to it, got scorched but didn't catch fire. And uh, that's, you know, that's impressive. Uh, and so the city will now send in a building inspector to officially declare the place, uh, you know, irretrievable or whatever word they use, and they may try to save the facade, 
because it is a masonry facade and it is kind of attractive. It fits in there. Yeah, I wonder if they can save it, save it, or whether they have to do some. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've seen it done take before. Take it down and put it back up, sort of. Yeah, I don't know, but we'll find out. So we'll follow up with that. Um, Certainly. The the Kevin Sutherland, the chief of staff of the city, was there, kind of representing the city, and he's the one who told me about the building inspector. Well, it sounded like I talked to uh, the mayor earlier today on the. Another topic, and he said he was up there with uh, the inspector, insurance guys, and okay. the owner was up there. Um, and I don't know their names yet. You might, but the I don't. owner, uh, the owner of the chapter house, is also not the owner of the building. So, we're oh, going to see how that works out when you start doing insurance for everything. And yeah. So, so hopefully it can get back to that. Yeah, it's a good a, spot. There's a lot of there's PA equipment in there. There was just the physical. Uh, plant of the bar was really scarred and beautifully scarred. You know, mm -hmm. it's like really old graffiti and yeah, the, pictures ba the of bathrooms are a trip. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, well, they usually are in a bar. Yeah, um, you can tell there'd been some. It, they were tripped downstairs. For yeah, the that too. Uh, Not fun at midnight. All right. Well, so that's, so that's that the for, house. for the moment. Uh, so you wrote this week about purple skies and wind power. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what's going to happen when we change to wind power. The sky will turn purple. Um, <laughs> that's what we're all looking forward to. So um, what's, uh, what's the status of renewable energy? Well, the interesting thing about this is that uh, when I was uh, a teenager in the 1970s, and renewable energy, I think it was called alternative energy back then, uh, they were selling it as a new way of looking at energy use. Um, you weren't supposed to just expect to walk into a room and flick a switch and, and be, just be happy that your coal-burning power plant was puffing away somewhere. You were supposed to take more responsibility for your, your energy and, and to uh, move towards using a sort of complementary set of energy sources. And so, you know, the big three are hydro, uh, wind, and solar. And, but the, you know, the interesting thing is that our commercial propensity seems to be sort of making whatever is cheapest and works best in, for the consumer is really kind of taking hold. And so around here, solar is just really taking off. Um, we've done stories on that. And, you know, the sort of, then the Solarized Tompkins uh, nonprofit has gotten you know, just hundreds of people, I think, um, to put solar on their houses. But wind. Uh, oh, and, and uh, so I, I talked to Joe Sliker, who is the, one of the owners of Renovus Energy. And he was saying, OK, if you want to put a solar array on your house, it's about $15,000 you know, for sure. all your energy needs, plus you know, metering back. And with incentives, because the state gives out incentives, it gets it down to about $5,000. So that's pretty quick payback. But well, it's, I believe also, it's just um, for you. Uh, does the state offer any sort of uh, like loan program? I know I was looking at. Yeah, nice at heard, a, I think. I was also I was looking at uh, alternatives. They're a credit, and they have a specific setup of low rates for any sort of like solar yeah, or so, wind. Yeah. Uh, and so the, you know, so, the focus is on solar, because it's 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 something that you can afford. Uh, by con by contrast, the same amount of energy uh, generated by wind, you're looking at a startup cost of like eighty thousand dollars. Which you know is quite the payback period, and and there aren't yet all these incentives and la la la, so you basically have to go out and buy your own, uh, your own turbine, and the other thing that makes them Which different aren't sitting around on Craigslist just waiting to be picked up. It's someday scrap. that will happen. <laughs> someday if Craigslist survives, though. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, but a turbine is a mechanical thing, you know it's got a lot of moving parts. And it's, it's, you know, 400, well, actually, the, the ones for, uh, uh, for home use are probably 200 feet up in the air, mm -hmm. or 120 feet up in the air, you know, high <laughs> in upstate New York in the winter. You know, it, things can go wrong. This is all Joe Sliker basically telling me this. And, you know, he's, he seems right. Uh, so, you know, for the homeowner, it's just more work. You know, you got to keep after this thing. If it breaks, you have to fix it. Whereas there's no moving parts in solar, you know they, they, they you know you slap them on your roof and you're good to go. So um, that's a big difference, and so it works best as a utility. 
And so I talked with it's the black oak. feeding into the system. Well, it's bigger too. Would, yeah. You know, so this black oak wind farm, which has been in the works for a decade now, is going to come online this year. Uh, or at least, you know, they're going to put up the turbines and everything. They're in their third and probably final round of funding, which is paying for the construction cost and that sort of thing. And this is seven turbines out on Connecticut Hill facing west. Um, and these are 475 foot towers. Uh, the rotors are like 100 feet across. And um, it's going to generate 12 to 14 megawatts and, and feed it all into the grid. And Cornell University has agreed to buy all of it you know, and, and just sort of pay whatever uh, cost there is to making this green power. Yeah, I think 12, and, 12 to 14 megawatts, I guess, to put that in perspective, I think the, the Cayuga plant is about 300. Right. And then their little solar array out there is like 1.2 or something. Mm -hmm. And they were going to add yeah. to that. Yep. So, so um, that's a decent, decent little chunk for... So this is a, yeah. a community-owned wind farm, uh, which is the first in New York State. Uh, Marguerite Wells is the sole employee of um, mm -hmm. Black Oak Wind Farm and a force to be reckoned with. Um, it's interesting, I talked to the, the sales manager at General Electric, GE Renewables, um, who said that, you know, as soon as he started talking to Marguerite, he was like, this lady can get this done. And he didn't care that there was only seven turbines. A lot of companies just didn't want to deal with such a small wind farm. But he was like, hey, I just want to sell some turbines, and this woman is going to make sure those go up. And so he, he, he was all about her. Did they get a lot of, a uh, I was curious, because those reports came out last month about Iberdrola. Iberdrola. Said, Iberdrola, um, the Ni NYSIG parent company, Spanish, being like the biggest recipient of federal monies for like the last 15. years. Be but most of that was because they were putting up a lot of wind farms. Yeah, they, they're bunch, the biggest. They were a bunch of wind farm cash in the uh, recovery acts. And they're the biggest wind producer in Spain. Are they? Yeah, they're really into wind. So I was just wondering if this project, did they get some of that? Is there money holding over from this or from no, years No, I mean, ago? this is, see, this is the, the supplier is, Iberdrola owns the, um, pr the distributor in this country. They don't own the producer. Okay. So this is an independent community-owned producer, which is so totally Ithaca in all the best ways. And um, there's 150 investors who mostly live around here who own this wind farm. Okay, okay. And, uh, and that, you know, it's, it's a small one compared to the rest of New York. There's uh, nine that are up and running in New York State, mostly in the west and the north, uh, near the, the lakes, the Great Lakes. Um, so this will be the 10th, I believe, or maybe the 11th. And uh, it's the smallest. And it's the one place in Tompkins County where you can get wind. Where is Connecticut Hill? Connecticut Hill is in the northwest corner of the county. Okay. So it's so. in mostly it's mostly in Enfield and Newfield. Okay. Okay. Uh, so and that's gonna that's that's gonna happen. So that will be our local wind farm. And there won't be that, that's the other downside of wind, is that so far with the existing technology, you you have to be have a, a really windy place. Sure. And and Connecticut Hill, which is the highest point in the county is the one place that has class three winds, um, which is kind of the slowest class of winds that you can harness uh, anywhere near here. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be it. I mean, people with smaller uh, turbines could perhaps put them up. There, there are, this one is, uh, this one is on uh, Congress Street Extension in north of Trumansburg. Okay. And, and you see other ones around. These, this is a Weaver 5. It f produces 5 kilowatts, I believe. And um, that's, that's kind of a household and a okay. farm scale uh, use of energy, plus metering it back. So it's, it's very interesting the way that wind works better as a utility. Solar seems to work uh, just fine as an individual homeowner. consumer, homeowner item. And then hydro is generally speaking been enormous, but um, uh, I want to say Gay Nicholson is it really into micro, micro hydro. Supposedly that was the original real like mechanical power like the Greeks had. 
Yeah, making little, electricity. Little, yeah, those crafty well, well, I don't things. know about electricity, <laughs> but we don't have anything before 500 or so. Um, so which, micro hydro is probably maybe the next interesting thing to come along. Uh, but we're, we're going someplace. Um, I want to say 2 to 3% of the total production in New York State is wind now. And uh, solar is, is still very small. For all the many that we talk about, they don't produce actually very sure. much. So their, their contribution to the grid is still way under which, 1%. Which oil and gas producers are happy to tell you if you read their PR people's blogs. But, but we're going to a different model of, of energy production. So that part of the 70s dream is still alive. Sure. So. Well, the, part of the uh, dream, well, it's not a dream. I'm, so we're doing school, a segue? Yes, I'm doing a terrible segue right now. Um, no, I saw it coming. <laughs> so uh, a much larger percentage, let's say, of students in New York appear to be opting out of state tests. Do you know the percentage? Well, exact percentages, considering state tests start on April 14th, Tuesday, um, okay. yesterday, as we're filming. Uh, the Ithaca estimate that they gave at yesterday's school board meeting was about, they're getting, getting about 15% opting out. 15? Yeah, oh, so they're oof. getting, and supposedly there's like Buffalo might be half. There's some hot spots in New York State. Yeah. Um, it's been generally reported that about 60,000 students opted out last year and expected to be, you know, optimist who are opt out optimists so um, are saying that might be tripled this which, year. So, what's the rationale for doing this? Uh, basically, to say there's too much testing in general. Okay. Uh, we don't want our kids to just be a number. Um, there's also a lot of concern about Pearson, which designs the New York test, also designs a PARC, P-A-R-C-C, -C, and I can't recall what that stands for. But um, New York opted out of using the PARC test and got Pearson to design their own test. But these big testing companies have taken a lot of criticism. Um, as I quoted uh, Superintendent Lavelle Brown today, uh, he's like, well, there's no, I've never seen a good test. So. Um, <laughs> That was, that was actually kind of a gnomic thing for him to say. I think I know what he means. You know, like you can't make a, you always get, the next one's always got to yeah. be better. But on the other hand, administrators, school board members are concerned. There have been, as they've been talking to state uh, education people, that if they don't make this 95% participation rate, which actually has nothing to do with Common Core, it predates that. It's from the No, no Child Left Behind. Sure. Um, and so they don't demonstrate AYP, adequate yearly progress, because um, they need that particip participation rate to show that. They might have to do more reports, certain amounts of their Title I funding might get withheld, or they have to report it in a different way. No one really knows. Even the budget people you talk to just... Don't I mean, know what it, the consequences will be? Well, there's no clear consequences. Oh, I thought there was like withholding of funding. Instead. Well, that's what they've been telling. There's the possibility. Oh, they think you think and they're parents, bluffing. Parent, well, parents who are really on this opt-out, uh, kind of write, writing hard on the opt-out thing, yeah. have been saying, no, they're, they're full of it. Um, huh. There's no definite, you know, it, the school would already have to be on the watch list to be worried about it because under New York's waiver that they are working under so they can use their own tests, um, they would have already had to be on this list like four years ago. And this is all very fun stuff to you know write about, and uh, well, it's a little bit be complex. So they're calling well, the, the fact that no problem. superintendents will actually, or anyone like that, really know anything. Yeah. So with that amount of uh, not knowledge, uh, we're going to take a break and be right back with more news. So we can just start whenever you feel like. Um, what, what are they talking about? Um, actually, you were, we what were you, the you were talking about the opt out. Yeah. Thing, which um, we can do. I know you know that stuff. So. We well, I, I know some of it because the Dryden, because uh, we did cover it. What have they been Dryden. saying about it? Uh, well, uh, Sandy Sherwood, who's the superintendent of Dryden Schools, can we start? <laughs> I guess yeah. we're starting. Right. <laughs> okay. Oh, hold up. I gotta switch which leg I got crossed. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Switch your legs. Um. So, Josh, I couldn't help overhearing. Oh, how'd you do that? <laughs> because I was in the booth. Um, uh, Look but, behind the scenes here. Right, a little, little behind the scenes. But uh, in Dryden, we also had an issue with the opting out. There's a Dryden parents' Facebook page, Dryden Opt Out. I haven't seen that one yet. Oh, yeah. Um, 
uh, they definitely are feeling feeling the heat and, and not wanting to um, have, have their any, kids take these. Do they have any guesses tests. how many, have you heard, how many they're estimating? I think that 15% estimate is okay. a pretty good estimate. Pretty close for I Dryden, mean, too. We'll see. But uh, Sandy Sherwood, who's the superintendent of Dryden Schools, uh, try to put the brakes on it on Monday's uh, school board meeting. She was saying that they could lose up to $700,000 in funding, um, that this could mean as much as cutting 13 staff. Ooh. Yeah, um, yeah, she was pretty alarmed. What's the, uh, now, where, where is she saying? Because like I said earlier uh, in ICSD, and no one I've really talked to is really entirely sure. I've read other letters from other districts. Yeah. A lot of it comes back to Title I funding. Yeah, that and whether is... they can use that kind of more at will or whether they'd be like specifically required to use it in certain places, which might affect certain positions. Yeah, but... it's okay. This is quoting from Sandy. Federal law says that failure to comply with the 95% participation rule uh, can subject states and school districts to sanctions including the loss of Title I monies and other federal funding, including IDA grants. Um, so what's interesting so about this is what are we, you know, opting out because these tests have become more prevalent. Um, but I mean, a lot of it's federal stuff that goes back 10 years that seems to be a lot of the, the actual money concern, um, which I presume these tests haven't been given every year before, I think it was 2012 they started every year. So yeah, what were they based on, like used to two be, grades or something? It, like, it used to be, um, I want to say fourth and eighth were the really important ones. And now it seems to be... Uh, so it's kind of they've upped the requirement for the testing, they've, but still... Right, which know. is also, it's a burden on the teachers because sure. they are losing class time and the districts often have to hire in monitors to yeah, watch for it because these. the kids right can't be monitored by their own teachers. Sure. And you also have these rooms now where they need to put the kids who are opting out and give right. them stuff the, to do. The and kids I've... who are, yeah, and and they're confused because they uh, <laughs> some of the kids are saying, well, we have to sign in and put our name on the test even though we're not taking it. I've seen some people complaining about that on you yeah, know, that's... the Facebooks and saying, oh, well, does that mean they didn't actually opt out and we won't send her message? So it's certainly been a heated issue here. Um, we'll see how it goes, especially, you know, since that teacher evaluation bit still is kind of getting hammered out some, in some, some room in the education yeah. department. So. Yeah, it seems like some form of blackmail, but maybe it'll, <laughs> maybe it'll work. Um, <laughs> Well, also, so you you were uh, in the flakes this week. We were talking about the the lake. Not we're talking about the lake levels. If anybody noticed, it went up 2.3 feet case you, uh, between March 27th and last week. In case you were standing in the it's lake a, for that time, watching oh, it come up well, to your waist. Well, I noticed it was really, really low. I mean, there were you know there was a, a mile of. of um, mud that you can't usually walk on. So, it was, so that was interesting to see. The Canal Corporation uh, decides the lake levels. And up at the north end of the lake, our writer Clara McCarroll took the cool picture of the mudlock. If you go boating up around the north end of the lake, um, there's the lock and that's where they let the water out or in as occasionally Depending the as case it. may be. Right, so you know they they do try to regulate it so that the dock owners don't suddenly have uh, their boats in the mud or floating up, yeah. Or, yeah, that sort of thing. So it was an I thought it was an interesting story because I've always wondered, and people say, "Well, they're letting the water out." Like, who is they? You know, <laughs> why, what are they? Who are these people who turn this spigot? It's usually and, the Illuminati. I, right, it's. Canal Corporation, uh, an okay. arm of the Illuminati. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> that was the opinion section of the show. Uh, there was no reporting behind that at all, at least not on any reputable blogs. Right, if you play it really slowly, <laughs> you will not get a message. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you play this show very slowly, um, come down and hang out, because you obviously needed other things to do. But. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, thank you.
Thank you for going around the lake with us for this week. We'll see you next time.